The next thing we want to talk about are respiratory problems. And as we start talking about respiratory things, I thought we'd start right off with a question. A six-year-old is awake and alert following a tonsillectomy. Which is best for the nurse to offer the child? A cherry popsicle, ice cream, apple juice, or hot tea? And the correct answer is number three, apple juice. You want to give them cold, clear, non-red liquids. So we don't want a cherry popsicle because it's red. We don't want ice cream because it is not a clear liquid. We are concerned that milk products make you have to clear your throat. And we would just assume that the child did not have that mucus production and have to clear his throat in the first few hours after a tonsillectomy. We'll let the parents give them ice cream tomorrow at home. So the correct answer was the apple juice, the cold, clear, non-red liquid. Now, just a summary of some nursing care for children with tonsillectomies. Remember, the most common complication after tonsillectomy is bleeding. So we want to check them for any tendency to bleeding. They'll have some clotting studies done before surgery. We also want to check for loose teeth. Quite often, these children are in that five or six-year-old range which is when they're losing teeth, and this is surgery in the mouth. If there are loose teeth, they'll need to be removed um, during, the, or during the surgery. Afterwards, um, we talked about cold, clear, non-red liquids. Oftentimes, an ice bag might be indicated as well. Uh, many times, these patients are outpatient surgery, so after a recovery period, they'll be going home with their parents. We want to teach the parents to look for signs of bleeding, which could be frequent swallowing. Also, about 10 days later after the surgery, uh, there's another chance for bleeding when they um, scab, if you will, the healing area uh, kind of falls off. Another question for us. A six-year-old is admitted for a tonsillectomy. Which of the following is most important to obtain in a preoperative health history? Past evidence of easy bleeding, parents' reaction to anesthesia, child's perception of the surgery, or number of tonsillar infections. And the most important of these is number one, evidence of easy bleeding. Some of the others would be nice to know information, but that easy bleeding is essential to know information. A six-year-old is, is admitted for a tonsillectomy considering her age. Which of these is most important to include in a preoperative physical assessment? Any mouth or lip sores, signs of tonsillar inflammation, location of any loose teeth, or presence of swollen lymph nodes? And the answer would be number three, presence of any loose teeth. Uh, now, another question for us. A five-year-old is admitted in acute respiratory distress. He is sitting upright, drooling, unable to swallow, and looking panicky. A tentative diagnosis of epiglottitis is given. The nurse should plan to place which essential equipment at the bedside? Croup tent, padded bedsides, tracheotomy set, or suction apparatus? And the answer is number three, tracheotomy set. Now, with epiglottitis, this is a, a, a life-threatening condition, and the epiglottis is inflamed. And the epiglottis remembers that little flap that goes over the trachea uh, to close it off when you're swallowing, uh, eating, drinking, etc. Now, as that gets inflamed, if that totally blocks off, there's no airway getting no airway for the patient. So a trach set should always be kept at the bedside. Epiglottitis, another thing they like to ask about is the fact that once that diagnosis has been made, you don't want to keep putting a, a, a tongue depressor in there and looking at the back of the throat because that can only irritate it and may further inflame the epiglottis. Now, we might want to compare epiglottitis to croup. LTB stands for laryngotracheobronchitis we can, and croup which is a type of croup. Um, in croup, the child usually has had a respiratory infection. They're usually younger children than what we see with epiglottitis. 
They may have had a fever, but not a dramatically high fever like we saw in epiglottitis. And the most characteristic thing about croup is usually this, uh, this inspiratory strider. They sound like they're going to die as they, uh, with the croup. And they have this brassy kind of cough. Now, most children don't die with croup. They just sound that way, but they don't really die with croup. In croup, we like to put them into a mist tent, uh, so they do well with humidity. So a croup tent has got uh, humidity and oxygen. We might uh, tell them if they were at home and, and the parents were managing the child at home to go in the bathroom, close the door, turn on the shower, and just stay in this high, humid atmosphere. You don't have to get in the shower, but stay in the high humidity of uh, the bathroom, and that helps. Conversely, sometimes people will take the child out in the cold, dry air, and once in a while that will help as well. Um, but croup is not usually life-threatening. A five-year-old is being admitted with a bronchial asthma attack. Which item in the client's history is least likely to be related to the asthma attack? He got a new puppy, a visitor to his home smokes, there is an early snowstorm, or he ate a fresh fruit salad. Least likely is number four, the fresh fruit salad. Animal dander, cats, dogs frequently cause asthma. Smoking aggravates or causes asthma. And sudden dramatic changes in temperature frequently will bring on asthmatic episodes. It's possible someone could be allergic to something in the fruit salad, but it's least likely. The nurse is teaching a five-year-old who has asthma to blow cotton balls across a table. What is the best explanation for teaching this play technique? One, it decreases expiratory pressure. Two, it provides for an extended expiratory phase of respiration. Three, it promotes a fuller expansion of the thoracic cavity during inspiration. Or four, it develops the accessory muscles of respiration. And the correct answer to this question is number two. Now, I would suggest that you might want to try that. If you don't remember that during the exam, you could actually blow, pretend to blow a cotton ball across the table. This is an expiratory phase. So what we're doing is extending the expiratory phase. We're teaching purse lip breathing. Um, we, and for adults, you can teach them about blowing out candles. For children, it's blowing cotton balls, pinwheels, bubbles, uh, something to prolong the expiratory phase. Next, I'd like us to look at another condition that affects the respiratory tract. It also affects the GI tract, and that is cystic fibrosis. In cystic fibrosis, there's a problem with chloride metabolism. And the result of this, with this chloride metabolism problem, is that the child has really thick, sticky mucus. So they get all this sticky, sticky mucus. Now, as one of the things that's affected is it blocks the pancreatic duct. So this thick, sticky mucus blocks the pancreatic duct so that the digestive enzymes from the pancreas cannot get into the common bile duct and then into the GI tract, into the, into the small bowel to digest food. So the first thing that happens is they get steatorrhea, a fatty, frothy stool, uh, mal which and a malabsorption syndrome, which causes the steatorrhea and failure to thrive. FTT is failure to thrive. Another thing that happens is the respiratory ducts are all blocked with this thick, sticky mucus. And so this child of a few months of age may end up with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and right-sided heart failure. So they're going to be treated with mucolytics, chest PT, digoxin, diuretics. As another problem associated with the chloride metabolism issue is that they excrete more sodium so that mothers and fathers say they taste so salty when I kiss them. Now sometimes we can actually collect sweat 
and measure the amount of sodium in the sweat. If we look at this child with cystic fibrosis, you can see on the top picture this child is definitely a failure to thrive. With failure to thrive, and they have these huge stools. Now, once the child is given the enzymes, and remember we always give pancreatic enzymes with food to, so it can digest the food. Once the child is treated with these pancreatic enzymes, they may fatten up a little bit. Uh, although they tend to be skinny all throughout life. Now children with uh, cystic fibrosis, if they're male children, they will be sterile because the mucus is just too thick and sticky uh, so that the sperm cannot uh, swim through that thick, sticky mess. So male children are always sterile. Women may or may not be sterile. The life expectancy has uh, lengthened over the past few years, but still they frequently die in their 20s or 30s. Uh, it used to be that they died in their teens, but now it's frequently 20s or 30s. And they usually die of some type of respiratory involvement, respiratory infections. They frequently have respiratory infections. Cystic fibrosis is the most common inherited disease among American Caucasians. It is an autosomal recessive condition, which means that each parent must carry a gene for it. And then when they do, 25% of the children have a chance of having the disease. Uh, for more details about autosomal recessive and, and how that is transmitted and how it works, you might want to look at sickle cell anemia in the blood disorders uh, segment of this video of this review process.